Joining us now is Ojinika Ojiope with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jenny. Good morning, Dr. Bati. How are you, you are this morning? Gang, gang. Oh, I love that. <laughs> gang, gang. <laughs> you too. Good morning, Ayo. How are you this morning? I am good. Perfect. Gang, gang, OG. Uh, gang, gang, Ayo. I, mean, I don't know what that means. Well, good morning, Rufai. How are you this you morning? You are looking pepe, you have to add your own. <laughs> oh, Jenny, no, pepe, come on. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> How are you this morning? Ah. Uh. Okay. What do you feel? Have you bought full? No, 8K. I'm okay. looking for 8K to buy. <laughs> Rufai, your balance is too much. Well, all right. <laughs> Well, good morning to you, viewers. Let's begin what's trending. With reactions trailing a statement allegedly made by the Department of State Services on Tuesday against Maxwell Okbara, counsel to Godwin Emefele, the suspended governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Well, on Monday, a consortium of lawyers led by Maxwell Okbara and Ahmed Tijani stormed the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory to initiate a contempt charge against Yusuf Bichi, the Director General of the State Security Service, for failing to release a mefele despite a subsisting court order. Well, in reaction, an unverified DSS Twitter account posted a series of tweets accusing Okpara of mobilizing other like-minded lawyers against the DSS DG. The tweets went further to describe him as a Biafran Republic agitator. Well, let's take the tweets. Charge and bail over Zilius uninformed IPOP ESN lawyer, Maxwell Okpara, mobilizes other like-minded lawyers against DGSS, futile efforts. Well, Nigerians beware, this is in bad faith. Transferred aggression, the Biafran Republic agitator and outlawed IPOP counsel defending the suspended CBN governor. Is IPOP defending one of theirs? What a contradiction. Hmm, what's the connection? Is someone telling us something? May Maxwell be properly educated on points of law, please? Well, let's take some reactions. This is from Badibo, who wrote, The interesting thing about this group of 60 lawyers is that their president is Ahmed Tijani. But hey, the DSS must involve the IPOB to please their grandmasters and drive a narrative. The gate is real against the whole tribe their people, and their religion. Well, Olufemi wrote, it is instructive to note that this tweet is from a public institution whose mandate within the country includes counterintelligence, internal security, counterterrorism, and surveillance, as well as investigating some other types of serious crimes against the state. Its primary responsibility includes the collection of intelligence for good governance and national safety. It is structured to protect the state and its officials, citizens, critical resources, and infrastructure from domestic threats. Let that sink in. Well, Kweku wrote, that DSS tweet wasn't signed by their official spokesperson. As with other tweets, this leads me to conclude that it's deliberate to distract us from Tinubu and INEX failures at the tribunal. Rufai, while I catch my breath before you know, we go further, I did try to reach out to the DSS and the spokesperson. I haven't gotten a response yet. But I mean, this tweet, if it is actually from an official DSS account, I mean, this, this, this DSS account has been there for what? This March of this year was yeah. when they launched. When they the launched. official handle of the DSS. Official, official handle. handle. So, so we have to tweeting. wait to make sure that the, the spokesman comes out with this statement. Because if this is true, this is completely unacceptable. Refine. Okay, I mean, I'll send them um, Oga Peter for now, a message. I now. sent him a message uh, this and, morning. Um, I am um, Oji. If this is true, let's put a caveat. Yes. If this is true, it is, it is sad how low our country has become. And all the things they say about DSS, mm. about political slant, is beginning to reign supreme. And in fact, if this is true, we should cry for our country. And what there should be is there should be a collective purge of the DSS. The DSS is an elite security unit. When I think of the DSS, you think of the likes of MI6. You think of the likes of CIA, FBI, and you think of that elite state security service. But we have now been reduced to Twitter water water by our security service. 
In fact, you know, the security service should be so reserved that you don't need to see some things being put out there. Even the Stasi of Eastern Germany will not be so low to come to this extent to start Twitter water water. Right. And that's even a security service that clamped down a lot of people, that did a lot of harm to people when they were still Eastern Germany. So we would like to take their reaction, but this is a new low for Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And this is something all of us should cry about. But going forward, I think the National Security Advisor needs to meet with the president, and we really need to start rejigging. One, what makes up the Department of State Security. Two, our security architecture. This is a low. Absolutely. I uh Yes, it is. So just a, a quick overview of their handle, just to see that this is not the first information. They've actually been updating Nigerians via that platform since 6th of March when they um, joined social media platforms. It's as official DSSNG and they be, they're on Facebook, Instagram, But they're not Twitter. verified. They're you know, not, it's not the blue check no, mark. Was, all the yeah, they removed all the verification. They were, they actually had but verification there was an before. announcement there was on the 6th of March yeah. that DSS, and I remember the whole, you know, people said, oh, we have to be careful of our tweets now. They are watching and they have released press um, statements and um, others on, on their that platform, account, that particular yeah. account. They have 101.7 thousand followers. I saw that. That account. Yeah. Now, in terms of the, um, the the details of what they've mentioned, if you look at the lawyer um, that they, that is in question, Mr. Maxwell Okwara, this is not the first time Mr. Maxwell Okwara has spoken up or perhaps even gone to court to defend obedience or adherence to the rule of law. In 2021, he took the case of the former IG of police suing the president, President Muhammad Buhari, to court as well. So just to um, to, to address that fact that, oh, because there's a linkage between him defending Mazen Namdekanu and um, um, Gordon Mifele, the suspended CBN governor, and, you know, the, the, the terrorism, terrorism um, charge they're trying to um, push or promote. It is irresponsible if this is true, because they have, they have that was posted 21 hour, yes, hours and ago, it's still and there. there's no statement. Mm -hmm. It's still there. They haven't released a counter statement to say, oh, we remove ourselves from that particular statement. I think then, it's like you said, Rufai, it is very sad that they now demonstrate that the accusations, which a few days ago on that same account, they had said, oh, they are maligning their character, saying, you know, spreading lies about them, identifying five newspapers is actually true. It is disgraceful. And I believe that the DSS should have responded way longer than this and not take Nigerians for granted. Absolutely. We're waiting for that response. Okay. Dr. This Bashi. is what I think. One, there's nothing wrong in a security agency saying, you know, it will it will have uh, Twitter handles. In March, mm -hmm. what the DSS announced was that they were also going online. They announced their handles on Twitter, on Instagram, and also Facebook. And they've been running it since March. However, what we need to point out is that, look, how the secret police, how they use the social media should be different from the way other people use it. After all, EFCC, before now, also had a Twitter handle. And there was a gentleman who was in charge of that Twitter handle. And it was so humorous, he be, that handle became so popular yeah. with everybody because he used to poke fun, mm -hmm. you know, pass his message in a very humorous manner. So the thing to say to the DSS, Peter Afunaya and his team, is that they should be professional. Mm. Professionalism must be seen even in the way they tweet. Twitter is a territory for all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, characters, but Analysis. an institution like DSS must be seen to be above board yes. and should not descend to the level of the lowest or the low, yes. the mob that, has, that, that, takes part, uh, that participates uh, on social media, as it were. Two, the DSS also must not be seen to descend into the ethnic arena. It's a secret police protecting Nigerians, securing the environment and all of that, it shouldn't be seen to be ethnically biased. So labeling Maswell Okpara as an IPOB lawyer, no, I mean, that's, uh, that's a bit too much. Because when you consider the fact that there is even an Ahmed Tijani yes, who is their in that team. Yeah. So th those lawyers who went there, 60 lawyers, they were talking about uh, enforcement of fundamental human rights. 
they didn't go there as uh, ethnic uh, gladiators. And in any case, since they are lawyers, you know, they are there as uh, officers in the Temple of Justice. They didn't go there under ethnic uh, label. And a lawyer can take any brief. You can't come and mor moralize about it. So the lawyers in uh, the Department of State Services should also advise their communications people to know how they communicate with the public. The third point, however, is that, look, on this same issue, it's been reported this morning in some places that the lead counsel for, for um, Mr. Mefele is uh, J.B. Dawudu, Joseph uh, uh, Piodun Dawudu, SAN, former uh, MBA president, member of the body of ventures, and all of that, and that he's leading a team of lawyers. That's another set entirely, who have now, as reported, filed a case at the Lagos, uh, at the Federal High Court in Lagos, to say, look, release a Mefele. And the key prayer here is that the Mefele is saying, look, he should be released under Section 162 of the Administration of Justice, uh, uh, Criminal Justice Act, Act yeah, you know, and two, that he should in fact be granted bail on self-recognizance. The only clause in Section 162 of AGJA is that except the person is considered a flight risk. So there, there's another set of lawyers. So is the DSS now going to come forward and say, ah, JB Dawudu, uh, you know, you are leading uh, lawyers Yoruba, Rudu, because, lawyer. because you are a Yoruba activist. <laughs> they did it. So that's yeah, why the they need to there. stay yeah. professional. Yeah. You know, that's the key point uh, to be made. Well said. We'll take another story. Well, following the increase in petrol pump price from 540 naira per litre to 617 naira per litre on Tuesday, the group chief executive officer of the Nigerian Petroleum Company Limited, Mele Kiari, while addressing state house correspondents, blamed market forces for the increase, adding that the fuel hike is not based on a shortfall in supply. I don't have the details at this moment. You know, we have marketing wing of our company. So they are just prices depending on the market realities. And, and this is really what is happening. This is the meaning of getting sure, making sure that the market regulates itself so that, you know, prices will go up and sometimes they will come down also. And this is really what we are seeing. In, re in reality, this is how the market, market works. Well, our correspondents spoke to Nigerians across several states to get their reaction on the impact of the fuel hike. How do they even arrive at this, this uh, prices? Did they call anybody to a roundtable uh, this before they, 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 they increase it to, uh, from 190 something to, to, uh, to 500 and something? Or how do they do these calculations again? According to them, they say when they remove the subsidy, then the independent marketers can go into the business. Then the thing will start dropping. That is what we are expecting. We are expecting a, a drop from the hike of the price. Now it's another increment. To 617 naira. It looks as if we are working for the petrol station. Half of all we got go back to the fuel. And at the end of the whole day, you walk like an elephant, you eat like ants. I reach here to sell my food. I discover that all the drivers, people that have been coming here to eat food, none of them are here to eat food because of running to buy fuel. And at the end, the fuel have increased the price from where the, the initial price to the price that they cannot afford now, even to eat. They are finding it difficult. I want Tinibu to drive out, okay? Uh, maybe disguise himself. Come on the streets, go to Wuse Market, go to markets in Lagos, go around and see what is happening in Nigeria. And then realize the suffering that Nigerians are going through. Well, that could be a good idea, right? I mean, he said he's a musician. Yes. I mean, he should come out, Tinibu should come out and see how Nigerians are suffering. Well, in the meantime, the announcement made by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu to review the proposed 8,000 Naira conditional cash transfer to 12 million households meant to cushion the effect of the petrol subsidy removal is generating reactions. Well, in a statement by Dele Alake, the president's special advisor on special duties, communications and strategy, said the president also directed the immediate release of fertilizers and grains to approximately 50 million farmers and households in all the 36 states and the FCT. The president said the decision became necessary in light of views expressed by Nigerians against the cash transfer palliative. Well, let's take some tweets. This is from Daniel Rega, who wrote, Tinobu distributing fertilizers and grains to farmers is practically worthless as the monthly 8,000 Naira 
None of these plans address the pressing issues in Nigeria. The APC knows what to do, but still acting reluctant because it might not benefit those in power. This government isn't serious yet. Well, uh, Deepo actually posed different options in uh, revamping our economy. He wrote, welcome more investors, equal jobs, increase minimal wage immediately, manage inflation, invest in human capital, equal skills plus job, create an enabling environment, equals jobs, invest more in informal sector, equals job, reduce the cost of governance, equals savings, stabilize food prices, equals food security, invest in population control, address poverty head on, reduce inequality, tackle insecurity, tackle fake news. We can do these. We have the brains and the capacity to deliver. Nigeria will succeed. I really like to depose a tweet. Well, uh, NAOB, the outgoing country director of Action Aid and the Center for Social Justice in Abuja on Wednesday condemned the 8,000 Naira cash transfer, saying it will only cause more inflation. 8,000 Naira, you know, for many because of the earnings, this is going to cause more inflation. And if this is bringing down 8,000 Naira is not up to $10 in the market today. And so what are you giving people? Are you trying to pl placate people or are you giving this as a bribe to citizens? As a bribe to citizens, I thought that was a very important sound bite. Let me take one more tweet from uh, Dick Ball who wrote, I used to think urgent 2K tweets were all jokes. In reality, people really need that urgent 2K. Nigeria is tough. And the federal and state governments need to act urgently to ensure that the hardship is addressed. Dear President Tinubu, we need speedy actions. Ministers in place, ASAP. Palliatives delivered directly to the people. No corruption, no red tape, no unnecessary bureaucracy. It can be done. We have what it takes as a nation. And uh, Kalu uh, finally wrote uh, 49 days. I guess that's how many days uh, Tinubu's, been, uh, Tinubu's administration has been on, yeah. right? The largest economy in Africa has one, no central bank governor. Two, no minister of finance or economy, no minister of petroleum or energy, no minister of budget, planning or economic policy. I mean, obviously Nigerians are reacting because of the review that uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has said that he would do. But I also um, think that it is important that we highlight our ministry of agriculture at this point. I don't know if we can pull out that GFX where there was that uh, breakdown uh, in terms of the budget for the uh, supplementary appropriation where I believe it's about 19 uh, billion uh, Naira that was budgeted to the Ministry of Agriculture to address massive destruction to farmlands due to flooding. I mean, this appears to be capital expenditure. Mm -hmm. But you know that the largest food subsidy program in the U U.S. is food stamps. I think that this is where this administration to, should turn their heads to. Food stamps, that whole program needs to be funded accurately. Soup kitchens too. Soup kitchens are great. I think the two palliatives that we need, this is my opinion, is food. I mean, I don't know how he will do the uh, grains to the 50 million farmers. Mm. And transportation. State governments are doing well. River State government as yeah. well as uh, Borno State, Borno State yeah. Governor, in providing buses. Mm -hmm. They should just tackle that immediately. I think that is the main point here for me. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. So I think what I was saying this morning is the fact that, yeah, we've heard a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the solutions. The hardship is real on mm -hmm. people. In going forward, we need to be able to tackle logistical costs because when you look at what affects our inflation, is logistical cost mm -hmm. to a large extent. Logistical costs in even how we move petroleum products around the country. We should have train carriages for tankers so you can be able to latch them on onto a rail mm -hmm. so you can carry them from other parts of the country. Also, we have narrow gauge lines hitherto that were abandoned. Other countries in the world, you, you, despite the fact that they have fast trains and standard gauge, they see a lot of narrow gauge lines. Take, for instance, China. China has what we call those 18 hour long sleeper trains and they still have fast, quick trains. So can we use that to also move food around mm -hmm. and be able to reduce the price? We need to work on our energy mix and also incentivize local production of cars, like CNG cars and the likes, and also invest in gas, because we have a lot of gas in this country, but we waste them flat. And that's a sad reality. We have solutions to our problem, Oji, but we waste it because we've not invested in gas. Mm -hmm. 
Also, we need to be able to create buffers for the farmers. Apart from incentivizing the farmers, also build silos because most of the food is lost through post harvest losses, cuts that dominance of the middleman. All right. Also, another thing I feel we should be able to do is I have a, a plan called the 774 campaign. It's 774 local governments. Let their local governments be also centers for development in tech, for students, creativity, arts, and other areas that can buffer the economy. So what you do is build a center. And if I have the means, God knows my heart, I will build a center. Build a center for them, for children to be able to learn about technology, basic coding skills and all of that, improve their skills in arts, mm -hmm. also improve their skills in, you know, skills that can give them money and all of that. And don't just do that. Also market them. Take some of the skills and market them and help them set up business fronts. No. So these are some of the ideas we've talked at Nostrum. Yes. All of these things can be done. I don't see why governments, the 70 billion we're giving lawmakers for cars and, and the other furniture and all of that, why can't we, you know, plow some of that into companies like Innocent? Mm. Let them be the ones to produce the cars. Into companies like Nord Automobile. Right. Let them be the ones to produce the cars. You see, when you have problems, when you think about them, you can turn that problem into a solution. Absolutely. I, I do a lot of what's it called thinking, stoicism thinking. And Ryan Holiday wrote a book. Guess what the book says? It's titled, he says, the obstacle is the way. All right. The things we see as obstacle in Nigeria is actually the way to our prosperity if we think deeply enough. All right, then. We'll take our final story. The First Lady of Nigeria, Oluremi Tinubu, on Tuesday renamed the National Center for Women Development after the late Miriam Babangida. Miriam Babangida was the wife of Nigeria's former head of state, General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida, who ruled the country from 1985 to 1993. Miriam championed women's development during her reign as First Lady. Most notable was her grassroots program, Better Life for Rural Women, to empower women. She died of ovarian cancer at the age of 61 in December 2009, while Oluremi, at the unveiling ceremony, praised the late Miriam for her exemplary role in women's empowerment and national development. This center being renamed today has reinforced my belief in the need for us as a people to celebrate the contributions of the matriarchs of our land, especially in nation building. As I believe that Miriam Babangida National Center for Women Development carries a profound message of inspiration and aspiration for Nigerian women. Our Excellency Dr. Mrs. Babangida's legacy as a passionate advocate for women's rights serves as a constant reminder of what can be achieved when society invests in women's development. All right. I, I think what this highlights is the importance of monuments. I really, really loved the story when I saw it. You know that earlier President uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu had, you know, named about 15 airports under men, no, no woman. woman. <laughs> yes, right, so I'm going to start, and I think it's instructive to mention that the National Center for Women Development was actually set up in Nigeria in 1992 when um, Dr. And Mrs. Miriam Babangida was first lady. So it was under her watch, so it's fitting that it's um, named after her. Now, people call her the game changer. Mm. When you think about Mrs. Miriam Babangida, what you often remember is her fashion, but very importantly, beyond the fashion, is that she gave the title of first lady substance. Mm -hmm. So going beyond just a ceremonial role, she used and leveraged that opportunity, leveraged it to uh, improve the lot of women, especially rural women. Remember the Better Life for Rural Women, yes. which was her pet project, and she perhaps was, was the pioneer of pet projects, and subsequently other first ladies there to um, have their own pet projects. But beyond just being the first lady, she was known for her contributions to building schools, clinics, even while she was the wife of, um, when um, her husband was the chief of army staff before he became commander-in-chief of the armed forces. It's important to honor the memory and legacy of women like that. Say what you may, criticism about the style of government, but this woman redefined leadership for women, especially as first ladies. So thank you very much to the government. This was actually passed by the Ninth Senate. It and was. Just, um, um, launched um, by it was the launched, first yeah. lady. Absolutely amazing. Well, Dr. That Batsi. clarification is important because some of the uh, media outlets are reporting Remy Chinubu honors uh, Miriam Babangida or uh, Remy Tinubu renames National Council for Women Development Headquarters. The first lady, the wife of the president of Nigeria, does not have executive powers to rename anything. Mm -hmm. So what people must know 
is that this was uh, the amendment to the uh, NCWD Act of 2004, mm -hmm. which was passed by the Senate in March 2023, the House of Reps in uh, April 2023, assented to by the president at the time, mm -hmm. President Buhari, in May 2023. And it's on the basis of that 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 particular center has been named after Mrs. Mary Ambabangida, now of blessed memory. And as everyone has said, yes, she's most deserving of it. Mm -hmm. She'll be most remembered, not for fashion, but for the commitment to a pet project, Better Life for Rural Women. Because at that time, she centralized the interests of rural women. And what is her argument? About inclusion mm -hmm. of women, about increasing women's participation, about looking out for the interests mm -hmm. of women across the board whether it's financial inclusion or with health and other aspects. So, you know, honoring her mm -hmm. is most deserved, not yes. because she was first lady, but because she made a difference and she put the effort into it. And it's a lesson for other first ladies at national and subnational level about how you can make a difference. Absolutely. About how you can add value mm -hmm. uh, to your husband. Well, so right. I don't think it's about fashion, although she was glamorous. Charismatic. It was never they will remember her more well, for women empowerment. Well, commitment. thank you all for your great analysis as always on what's trending today. But well, that's all I have for you on what's trending today. I'll see you all tomorrow.